welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus to this our evening service and our call to worship this evening comes from Psalm 47. Psalm 47 says, clap your hands all you nations, shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord most high, the great king over all the earth. He has subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose up our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. God has ascended amidst shouts of joy. The Lord amidst the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Amen. He is the God of the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. And this morning we found out about Jacob. We found out about what an absolute scoundrel he was for much of his life as he continued to rebel against God, and yet God had mercy on him. And so this is a God of grace that gives undeserved love. That's the most secure love of all. Not only that, this psalm reminds us that God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. And that should instantly make us think of the ascension of the Lord Jesus, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father, now lives to intercede for us and one day is returning in glory to rescue us. But until then, we can sing this psalm with confidence and joy. We're going to do that in this, our opening hymn, All Nations Clap, Your Hands and Shout. place our spiritual eyes on the awesome Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. Mm -hmm. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that the church, the gospel, 
the authority of the scriptures has subdued nations. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that we are under the feet of Jesus. We praise you and worship you, that you are a God of grace. You're able, even able to love Jacob. And therefore, Lord, we are assured again of your undeserved love to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that having conquered the grave, you ascended amid shouts of joy. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you now receive the glory that you deserve, and even greater glory for the things that you chose to endure while you were here on earth. And Lord, we join with all the saints who have gone before us, we join with the angels and archangels, and we sing praises to our God. We sing praises to our King, for you are the King over all the earth. We thank you for these wonderful songs that we can sing. We may not sing them to the tune of, uh, that you sang when you went, went to synagogue, Lord Jesus. We may not sing them in the same language, but we feel and experience the same power of these glorious songs of praise. We thank you and praise you, dear Lord, that you are here in our midst. You are here meeting with your people. We thank you for that glorious privilege that we have. We pray, dear Lord, tonight that we would sense you close. Feed us as we come round this table. Humble us again. Help us, dear Lord, to appreciate just how amazing grace is. And help us to trust you. In the name of you, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. In your glorious and precious name. Amen. 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 Just as we prepare our hearts for communion, we're going to remind ourselves again of what it was that Jesus uh, did when he, uh, before he ascended into heaven. We're going to sing, From Heaven You Came, Helpless Babe, and use this as a way of reminding ourselves of the deeper meaning that lies behind the table of the Lord. <laughs>
As we approach the Lord's table, um, we often read, uh, nearly always, uh, um, I prefer to read uh, the words of institution that Paul gave us, what I received from the Lord is what I also pass on to you. And that's found in your Bibles on, uh, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But that passage that we read almost every single week is followed by these words. They need to be read, not all the time, but we need to be reminded of them as well. It says uh, um, to prepare our hearts. In verse 27 it says, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. trying to point out in some of the songs that we sing that uh, yes we do this in remembrance of Jesus but in some mysterious way that I'm, I'm completely incapable of explaining to you but sometimes we sense and feel we are participating in the body and blood of Christ. I believe we're lifting up our hearts into the very throne room of heaven and as Jesus intercedes for us he presents his body, his flesh, his blood afresh on our behalf and we experience that. And we receive that through these elements, taken by faith. And we don't take these things lightly. These are serious things. So Paul says, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Scholars disagree. Is he talking about the body of the Lord, being us being the body of Christ? That makes sense in terms of the, uh, what Paul then goes on to say in the following chapter uh, about us being the body of Christ. But it's more than that. It's that resurrected, glorified, ascended body interceding for us. And we long to discern our need for him. We long to feed by faith on all that he has won for us. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Again, very serious words. We can't shy away from these words. They're there in the scriptures. But they remind us again of the importance of this table. So we'll pause. We will seek by faith to discern the body and the blood of the Lord. To see our own need for that. But also we will examine ourselves in the privacy of our own hearts. Bring those faults in the privacy of our own hearts to our Lord. There we will find forgiveness because he is the God of Jacob. He is the God who loves sinners and who sent his own son to die so that we could be released from the burden of guilt and shame. Let's just bow our heads, as I say, and just quietly for a minute or so, just examine ourselves, bring those thoughts to the Lord, and then I'll, um, we, we will. Pray, pray to get, um, I'll pray on our behalf um, collectively. Lord Jesus, you examine the hearts. In fact, you were there when we did sin. And so as we confess our sins to you, we're not surprising you. We're just simply trying to be honest before you. 
But as we look at our own sin, dear Lord, we discern the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that body and that blood sacrificed in our place. That guarantee of forgiveness of sins. And that's our hope, dear Lord. We won't earn extra brownie points with you. Our salvation won't be better if we beat ourselves up and wallow around in our ship, guilt and our shame. But if we simply, by faith, accept your forgiveness and respond out of love and gratitude, dear Lord, that it is finished, oh, this cup will be sweet. We will taste and see that the Lord is good. And therefore, Lord, we confess our sins. And by faith we accept your forgiveness. And Lord, now receive our joyful, grateful, relieved hearts. Knowing that we are so loved, so forgiven, so completely accepted through the body and blood of our Saviour. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? <clears throat> Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Paul writes, What I receive from the Lord is what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus Christ, we don't fully understand the mystery of these words, but we long to experience something more of their reality. Here, dear Lord, our bodies, our senses will just eat bread. But Lord, if you send your Holy Spirit and lift our hearts into the throne room of heaven, we will be blessed again by that glorified, resurrected body that intercedes for us and pleads for our salvation and reassures us again. And as our bodies hunger for bread to live in this life, dear Lord, how much more should our souls crave for the manna that comes down from heaven. Help us to truly feast on that glorious bread of heaven. Amen. 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 <coughs> we have a, a, a gluten-free option, which is on the little plate. <coughs> you do ask for that if you need that or if you would like that. And then we will eat as individuals and then we'll drink the cup together to remind ourselves of our unity.
the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll distribute the cups, we'll hold on to them, I'll then pray, and then we'll drink together. Lord Jesus Christ, we take this cup, this cup is the new covenant in your blood, that precious blood that wipes away all our sins. As we drink, dear Lord, make these things real to our hearts, our bodies, our souls, to all of us. Cleanse us, change us, and empower us to live for you. God and Father, we come to you again, and again we come with all of our needs, all of our troubles, all of our worries, all of our concerns, our private concerns, our worries about our future, our health. We bring before you our loved ones, our friends, our neighbours family. And the needs are enormous, dear Lord, but you are far, far greater than our needs. Lord, as we pray in our silence of our hearts, as we name those names, we just ask that you would hear our cry to you. Bring provision, bring reconciliation, bring healing, in conversion.
Lord, again, we pray for Marlene. Just pray, dear Lord, that uh, over in Denmark with uh, Jacob and Emily, that they would thrive over there, mm. that the language learning would improve, mm. that you would provide them with a, a home to live in, a flat that would be suitable for her physical disability, uh, that the children would be supported with uh, their challenges. Have mercy on them, dear Lord, and bless Damien here tonight as well, as he's separated from her. Lord, keep him strong. Mm. And just pray that everything would happen smoothly for him now, mm. and that the house would be sold and he'd be able to re reunite with his family soon. Lord, again, we're aware that there are people in our congregation that are housebound that are in nursery, home, uh, nursery um, nursing homes. Lord, please watch over them. Give them your peace. Even in their old age and in their infirmity, give them moments of clarity and hope and joy where they can truly sense the presence of Christ, mm. where they can truly look forward to heaven. Mm. Help us to love and support them. Again, Lord, we want to pray for this cruel situation in, um, in Ukraine. We see the pointless death of so many people. We just long for peace, dear Lord. We just pray, dear Lord, that there would be uh, a, um, a movement for peace, that there would be uh, a, um, an end to this wicked war. We also pray for Syria. Again, we think of especially of all the Christians that are in Syria that, that, um, that have suffered such persecution as a result of the chaos there. We pray for peace there as well. We pray for Eritrea and for um, uh, Ethiopia. We pray for Somalia. We pray for the other countries, dear Lord, like uh, um, Mexico and Colombia that are under the drug cartels and there's just such cruelty, devastation and chaos, such wickedness, such war, such bloodshed. Prince of Peace, please come. Lord, we know none of these things can happen unless you send out your gospel. So we pray for the work of the Slavic Gospel Association, pray for the work of Tear Fund, we pray for the work of uh, Release International the other organizations that we support as a church. We just long, dear Lord, that you would bless and multiply their ministries. <clears throat> oh, hear our prayer, dear Lord, for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> We're going to prepare our hearts for the uh, word of God as we sing, um, conclude our time around the table, and also prepare ourselves for the message this evening as we remind ourselves that the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can tell. <coughs>
Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to take up our Bibles now and turn in the Word of God to Titus. This short little letter to Titus, it's only three chapters long, just a couple of pages in our Bibles. You'll find that on page 1198. Page 1198. We're looking at Titus chapter 1, and we're going to be reading from Titus chapter 1, verse 10. And we're going to carry on reading down to chapter 2, verse 10. Heavenly Father, as we turn in your word, we pray that you would speak to us. Help us to understand it. Help us to live by it. Help us to be challenged by it. Help us to uphold what it teaches. And help us to live it out in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Just to give the context to verse 10, I'll read, start from verse 9. Um, um, he, uh, a, a leader in the church, an elder, he must firmly hold to the trustworthy message as he has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Verse 10, for there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced. Because they are running, ruining whole households by teaching things that they ought not to teach. And that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, so that they'll be sound in the faith and will not pay, pay no attention to Jewish myths. For the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. They can then train the younger women to love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled, pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have no bad thing to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. This is God's word to us this evening, and you can see that, just like today, there were false teachers in the church. And they came from two broad camps on the island of Crete, where Titus was. There was the uh, pagan Crete philosophers, and they were learned men, they knew the, uh, the ancient Greeks. He quotes here uh, um, uh, Euripides, I think his name was, uh, who lived 600 years before. Here he was, 600 years later. How many of you can name some, quote something from, that was written 600 years ago? Maybe some of you might be able to quote To Be or Not To Be, which was just written a few hundred years ago. But they were learned scholarly men. And they knew their equivalent of Shakespeare and their classics. And uh, people were amazed. They wanted to learn. They wanted to make sense of the world. But the other source of opposition and false teaching were the Jewish people themselves. Tragedy of tragedies. The Jewish people who couldn't face the thought that they had crucified their own Messiah. That they were guilty of rejecting 
the eternal Son of God. It just seemed too offensive to them, too ridiculous. No, we were the special people, we're the chosen people. We can't share this with the other nations. God loves us, not everybody else. And so those that held on to that pride, that uh, superiority that was characteristic, sadly, of some Jews at the time, they stirred up trouble. They caused all sorts of problems. Uh, you only need to read the book of Acts, and you find that Paul himself, the most frequent source of opposition he found was when he preached in the synagogues and when he was driven out of the towns. It wasn't the local pagans that mostly tried to kill him and stone him and cause him problems. For the most part, it was the, his fellow Jews. That's part of the tragedy of uh, the New Testament period. And so Paul is very, very realistic. But today, we have people within the camp, as it were, that should be part of the church, that are teaching heresy and bad things. And then we have pagans outside the church as well, that are also teaching bad things that cause destruction and undermine the faith and undermine the hope and the joy and the confidence of Christians. Things haven't changed. We still need to be able to be firm and clear about where we stand as Christians. Uh, there was some, chain, uh, some talk when I first arrived at the church. Somebody suggested, a couple of people suggested, uh, why don't we change the name of the church to Parkside Community Church? That would be a little bit more friendly and welcoming to the church. That word evangelical doesn't really mean too much to most non-Christians. And I see where they're coming from, and I think that there's something admirable uh, just on the superficial level about that. It's a good thing to desire to be accessible to the, to the community. But I always felt very uncomfortable about the, that. It doesn't, that word evangelical doesn't, mean, uh, doesn't need to mean too much to the outside world. What it needs to mean is a, a, a lot. It has to mean a lot to us who worship in here. That word evangelical means that we are Bible-believing Christians. We accept the word of God that we find contained in the 66 books of the Bible. First and foremost, that word evangelical, we find evangelical uh, Anglicans, we find evangelical Baptists, evangelicals are found in many different denominations. We have that in common with them, a common desire to uphold the authority of the word of God. Secondly, it means that we also believe that you must be born again. You have to come to know Jesus as your own personal saviour. And then the final thing that evangelicals should sum up for us as we think about that word is that as evangelicals we have the duty of bringing the good news. We have to evangelize other people. Other people need to hear about Jesus. And so those three things are for me are what the, uh, the word evangelical stands for. And it's worth us holding on to that name, not because it means so much to the rest of the world, but because as we enter underneath that sign, it's a reminder to us and our identity, our commitments, our priorities. And from that, we actually have a basis for disagreement. Uh, I did evangelism in the past, and I've done uh, debates with atheists and various other things. We even had an atheist at, at a formal debate in this church at one stage. Uh, and there is a position for that. It's important that we should be confident, if it's not a ministry that God's called me to full-time, we should be supporting and listening to and learning from uh, people, men that, uh, and sometimes women that are out there and trying to uphold the authority of the Word of God in the public square. Praise God for them. Thank, thankfully, there are some wonderfully, wonderfully gifted men that are able to deal at a very deep level and at a very popular level and are great communicators, and hallelujah for them. But from that, we need this foundation that we don't compromise on, which we found, find in the Word of God, because there will be rebellious people. What's the rebellion about? The rebellion ultimately is about the fact that we all have a conscience. All human beings made in the image of God have the law of God written on their hearts. They may try to deny that, explain it away. But there's always that feeling of guilt, that feeling, feeling of shame, that feeling of uh, unworthiness. These are real, powerful emotions. We experience them as Christians. 
But thankfully, as we reminded ourselves as we came around this table, we have a way of dealing with that, a wonderfully, gloriously healthy way of dealing with uh, and processing our guilt. We leave it at the foot of the cross. We accept forgiveness. We find joy as a result of that. But what do you do with a guilty conscience in the absence of the cross? Well, you've got to do with it, something with it. So the world has different solutions. One of the popular solutions is to try and drown it in drink and drugs and pleasure and TV and all sorts of other things. Another solution is to explain it away. The reason I feel guilty is because of society. And if I can change all of society, then I, uh, uh, um, if the opinions of other society start to change about my personal sins and the things I'm doing, the lifestyle that I'm living, then well, maybe, maybe if they can all be uh, called good, evil, and evil, good, if they can affirm my sin as actually being something wonderful and positive, then let, maybe that will make me feel less guilty. That's how the world is. And then, of course, we have people within the church that want to, uh, they see the effectiveness of the world, they think, see the power of these ideas outside of the world, and they think, Christianity could be even better if we could import those things and force them into the Bible and get rid of the bits of the Bible that don't fit in with that. And then, then finally, when we are exactly the same as the world, the world will come flooding into the churches and the churches will be packed. They've been trying it for a hundred years or more, and it hasn't worked. But we have the authority of the Word of God. They are a, many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group, as I said, the main opposition in the first century. They must be silenced because they're ruining whole, householder, whole households by teaching things that they ought not to teach for the, uh, for the sake of dishonest gain. And there's always a catch, isn't there? There's always a monetary thing. We find this with the false teachers within the church that are on the satellite TVs. Send in your money, send it, uh, and you will receive the blessing. God will repay you back a hundredfold, a tenfold. Uh, just give me your money and uh, uh, make your faith pledges and all of these other things. It still happens to this day. And then for the popular, uh, for, for the popular atheists, remember ten years ago or five years ago, there was uh, uh, Richard Dawkins was everywhere, and the God delusion was sold everywhere, and he became fabulously wealthy as uh, as the people in the media decided maybe if we can get rid of these wretched Christians, I will feel less guilty. Maybe if they stop talking about sin, I wouldn't feel like a sinner. Let's promote Richard Dawkins. Let's make him massively wealthy. And so they still do it for dishonest gain. I love the way that he says in verse 12, almost slightly humorously, even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always ev uh, liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And of course, the irony is that, uh, um, that the man he's quoting there, that lived, lived 600 years before, was a Cretan himself. And then you get one of these silly philosophical paradoxes. Well, if he was a liar, uh, then uh, his, if he was a Cretan, he was a liar. And if he was a liar and he said that the, the Cretans are liars, is that true? You know, you've got these silly philosophical circles that you can run yourself round and round and round. And yet you can sound very clever. Uh, it's a, a sort of a form of egotistical uh, nonsense go round in circles like that. And he says, don't, therefore rebuke them sharply. It's just nonsense. Don't get caught up in these clever sounding arguments. See them for what they are. Laugh at them, dismiss them. Pay, but equally, pay no attention to Jewish myths or to commands of those that reject the truth. Equally, we do acknowledge that there are false teachers within the church. And again, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Are these things that have been taught, that, uh, uh, are they in accord with the word of God? If not, ignore them. We're not part of a denomination, but it's something in this church that I hope and pray that you wouldn't tolerate being taught from the pulpit here, uh, in my absence or in any other circumstance. 
We don't have the ability to control other churches, but God has delegated to us the responsibility of not fixing everybody else, but trying to role model what God would have us to do. And if God blesses that, maybe that will draw in more people. Maybe people will see that and they'll say, they've got something special at Parkside. What is it? What's their secret? Let me tell you the secret. It's this book. It's the word of God. Preach it with conviction and joy and, co and compassion. Preach it with sincerity and longing that people would come to the truth. And then God bless your church. God bless you and as you transform your church. That's our hope. If we could just be a role model for other churches, if we could live it out ourselves, maybe that would be reflected and re replicated in other churches as well. Maybe God will bless us. So he says to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. The fact is that there are some teachers that do genuinely come to a right uh, understanding of the truth. There was a heresy called uh, um, the Worldwide Church of God back in the 1970s, I think it was, and they denied the Trinity and they, they, uh, they were popular and evangelistic. And they're one of the extremely few heresies that after the leader died actually came to the biblical understanding of the Trinity and rejected a lot of their false teachings. It does happen occasionally. And praise God for that. We should never give up. You know, sometimes it is worth having that, uh, that conversation on, the, on your doorstep with a heretic that knocks on the door with his magazine or, his, uh, 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 or whatever. Sometimes you, it, it is worth it. Not often, but sometimes you can just sow a seed of doubt in that person, and that person. And there's many people that come from Mormon backgrounds and from Jehovah's Witness backgrounds that have come to know the truth. But don't expect it to always work. It says... To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. It takes a genuine miracle to rescue somebody from that. That's God's job, and sometimes he involves us in doing that. But what we need to concentrate on doing is, as Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. We look for those that God is already working in our heart. We seek to strengthen and bless those. We seek to build, uh, build them up. And then we hope and pray that you will have the courage to invite your friends in. And that your friends, your neighbours, your, your family members will sit under the sound of the gospel. And God will give them ears to hear. And that they too will hear. They claim to know God, but that by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. It's tempting to just leave that passage, and I could have preached a whole sermon just on that one passage, but there's a danger that comes with it as well, which is that we can end up as pharisaical heresy hunters. And we go around examining people. I'm not too sure if I can trust you. I'm not too sure that you're exactly right on this fine point of doctrine. In fact, I think that uh, I've got such a great understanding of doctrine that I've got to try and explain to you. And if you reject my understanding, then uh, you're heretics. And so suddenly nobody's good enough. If I told you about the Scottish uh, uh, Free Presbyterians uh, sitting on the train and they were having a conversation, a husband and wife. And uh, they were saying to, uh, to, the, to, uh, to the man, uh, well, the man was saying to the couple, uh, so why is it that, you, that you're members of the Free Presbyterian Church? He says, that's because we only have the truth. Of, uh, the, the truth alone is in the Free Presbyterian Church. And he says, so in fact, I'm not too sure about them either. I sometimes think it's just my wife and myself that has the truth. And I'm not sure about her either. <laughs> and that's the problem. Ultimately, a desire for the truth can turn into something that turns into prideful and arrogance. And so Paul immediately follows this. He didn't put in the chapter break. That's just for our convenience. He just carried on with the next sentence. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in the faith, and in love and endurance. This is something that we do collectively. Each and every one of us that seeks to grow older in the faith need to learn to live out our love for the truth with these characteristics. It's not just head knowledge. 
This head knowledge that we have in the word of God has to be transferred into heart knowledge and then into our actions, into our attitudes toward one another, into that willingness to love one another. And sometimes that's difficult. We have to be worthy of respect, self-control. In other words, we can't get, uh, lose our temper or we can't go storming off or uh, anything else like that. We need to be sound in the faith, but also in love and endurance. That means sometimes we have to be patient with people. They don't always get it. They carry on misunderstanding things. They carry on with sins. They carry on uh, listening to, uh, to some false teacher uh, on the radio or on the TV. And uh, yet, by love and patience and endurance, can bring people like that back under the authority of the word of God. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way that they live. Not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Women can be teachers. To teach what is good. It's an encouraging thing. It's a, it's a specific context here uh, to teach what is good. Then they can train the young, younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self controlled, pure, busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to the husband so that no one will malign the word of God. There is an enormous need, uh, especially in this day and age, for younger, uh, uh, younger adults to know what a decent marriage is like. We live in such sexual anarchy where uh, people have multiple sexual partners before they even think about marriage. And all of these things undermine the sanctity of marriage. All of these things undermine the, uh, the ability to, uh, to work through problems. All of these things uh, undermine your self-worth and your self-identity and give, uh, give these crises. And there's always that desire to move on uh, it's, it's what I've always done with all of my previous partners. When things didn't work out, I just gave up and then I moved on. There's an entire culture that's entirely corrupt. There's the pro issue of pornography, there's the issue, issue of Tinder, and then there's the whole LGBTQ thing. All of these different things undermine the sanctity of marriage. And there's an opportunity for us, if God enables us, to actually role model what a functioning marriage can look like. To explain how it is that you work through those problems. To show how it is that forgiveness can happen and that marriages can be strong. And one of the greatest powerful witnesses that we can have as a church is to have a church full of uh, happy, functioning marriages. Such things can happen. I hope and pray that the majority of you have had, uh, uh, have had a functioning, blessed marriage. But it's a difficult thing, a profoundly difficult thing in this day and age, just as it was before Christianity spread across Europe, just as it was in, the, uh, in uh, Crete, in the Roman Empire. Similarly, to encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything, set them as an example in doing what is good, showing uh, um, uh, um, in your teachings, showing integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you will be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Again, it's character. It's not getting angry. It's not having clever arguments. It's not beating people uh, um, up with Bible verses and quoting theologians and everything else. It's these things lived out with integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech, doing, doing what is good. And then having nothing in our lives to be able to, uh, for other people to criticize us for. As in, uh, um, it says, teach slaves, I could say, uh, in our present context, teach employees to be subject to their employers and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. And again, what we are doing in our workplaces makes a profound difference, it's part of our witness. If our employers, if uh, the people who are hiring us to clean their houses or whatever else it is, if they see that we are dishonest and lazy, if we're cutting corners, then they just think, well, that's what Christians are like. This is a powerful testimony. Again, not one of bashing people with the Bible and quoting Bible verses, but a simple life lived with integrity speaks volumes. And so let me sum up. We need to uphold the truth. But we need to live out the truth. And these are not in contradiction. The church errs when we get obsessed with the truth and we become 
pharisaical and harsh and judgmental. Equally, the church uh, uh, errs when it ignores the truth and upholds being loving and merciful and kind and gentle and patient at the expense of the truth. And these are not in opposition. They harmonise beautifully with one another. But they're difficult to live out because it's a miracle. It's an ongoing miracle. It can only happen in constant, reverent dependence on God through the power of prayer, through humility and us willing to submit ourselves to the authority of the Word of God. But oh, what a blessing it is when a church lives up to that word evangelical, when we live these things out in the life of our church. What a blessing it is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we long to live out these things in our lives. We do long to uphold the truth, to defend the truth, but also to be patient and wise and gentle and sincere and concerned about others. To, to, we long to see people transformed and strengthened and healed, to, brought, to be brought closer and closer to Jesus. We long to see people saved. We long to be good witnesses. We long to live these things out in private, and in our workplaces, and in our homes. But all of these things require a miracle. Send that miracle, Lord Jesus, to us. May we live up to this infinitely high standard. Not because we can do it in our own selves and in our own strength, but because you are redeeming us. Through the blood of Jesus, in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to conclude our worship this, uh, this evening with nearer, still nearer, close to your heart, roll me saviour and never depart. This is what we need. If we stay close to Jesus, these things will come to us naturally.
love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.